more generally, and I think I told this to you, is that so one of the things that I think uh, a question that comes up in, when we're talking about representations is really sort of like how do we regard them, and I think of it in terms of sort of four different positions that are, I mean these are rough pos positions to take, which form a sort of continuum, and one would be representations are a real, and then one would you treat them as facts, another one would you treat them as artifacts, and then another as fiction, and the way I think about that is basically, so an extreme point of view of the copying thing is just that they're reals, that they're sort of metaphysically guaranteed in some sort of way. Facts would be to say that, that they still, that, they're, that, that, that the, still the paradigmatic function is some sort of truth function, that they tell us something true about the world. An artifact is more to look at them as sort of a tool, which even though it might co-vary in some sort of way, isn't quite a, there's no sort of like copying going on. And then finally a fiction, which would be like sort of that postmodern anti-representationalist stance, which is to say that representations are sort of purely invented, whatever that would mean. And I think most people fall in this, in the, the realm of sort of debating fact versus artifact rather than right. whether it's metaphysically real versus whether it's completely made up. Um, so yeah, so in, in that sort of sense, I, I, I guess I, I was laying that on the table and then, and then I, 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 asked, uh, I, I wanted to ask you um, sort of this question of, of medium independence of representations. Uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is then if, so medium represent, I, I accept of course that they're, that they're somewhat media independent, um, but then I, I have a question about uh, why then do neurons seem to provide this sort of like completely very useful substrate for doing these very complex sort of representational operations as opposed to using other kind, another kind of medium? Well, I guess I'll, I'll tackle the second point first. The point about medium independence is not to say that there is like a complete segregation right. between representations and the physical properties of the substrate. Of course, there has to be certain, there has to be like a physical system for there to be kind of information processing, right? But it's just that what the system is doing, what the cognitive system is doing is that it's sensitive to certain kinds of information. So it's, I mean, medium independence is kind of, I guess, a, a maximal way to put it. It's more that there are there are certain classes of material substrate that can, uh, uh, Wheeler was calling this an equivalence class, right? So there are certain classes of material substrate that can do the same kinds of things, right? So uh, it's like a functional equivalence. So the, the set of things that can play the role that a neuron is playing, I guess, would be the equivalence class. So, I mean, there there's a lot of focus on neurons, but like I was saying you know, in my talk, you, you could imagine that you know a chip in the brain could do the same thing as long as it's sensitive to the same kind of information and in that it can produce the same kind of output patterns. Then, in that sense, it's independent, but it's not like divorced from physicality altogether. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And the, the second, the, the first point you were making is a little more tricky. I uh, I don't know what I think about truth. I mean, I, I think truth is just tangentially relevant to the stuff I was, I was uh, presenting, you know, because, um, I mean, it, it, it's a metaphysical question, and in a sense, it, it has little bearing on how cognitive systems actually operate in the world, you know? Right. Like, as, from, from an evolutionary point of view, you know, truth, has, truth is not necessarily even super adaptive, so, um, like, you, you can think of prey behavior, Right, mm -hmm. so it's it's much more efficient for prey to to have false positives, right, than than otherwise. Like, it, you know, deer they hear a little crack in the crackling of the leaves and everything, and they'll bolt as if there was like some kind of predator. So that's not necessarily truth tracking. You know, right. all those times that the deer is bouncing for nothing, um, you know, it, it's not it's not an epistemically rational thing to do, but from an evolutionary point of view, it, it is rational to, it, it's, it's preferable to have false positives. So, but isn't that a representational semiotic process? They're responding to a signal that stands for something, that right. stands for a state of affair? Right, exactly, so it's, it's that there's a statistical relation between the two, right? right? But it's, it's like, I, I always feel that truth is kind of like an epiphenomenon, even to scientific practice. You know, as far as I'm concerned, uh, science doesn't necessarily, I mean, this is very controversial, but I don't think science um, deals with truth. You know, in science, we're in the business of constructing models. These models ha have a certain relationship to the world. We can call it similarity, you know. But I, 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 you know, I think it just complicates the matter. Uh, 
in not necessarily a very fruitful way by putting it in terms of truth. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, uh, I, th there is a sense in which I think, uh, you know, the, the cognitive system is really representing the world, right? So I was talking about predictive coding frameworks earlier. So in these frameworks, what you have is like different hierarchies of cortical processing that are sensitive to different time scales of invariance, right? So at, at very, very high integrative levels, like you're picking up very slow invariance, and at, at very close to the sensory end, you're picking up very fast invariance, like a, you know where someone is looking and, and so forth. So it's more a question of extracting invariance for the system, and I don't, I don't know if it commits one necessarily to a view, a specific view on truth. Mm -hmm. I, Do you have a question? Yeah, well my question is, is why if we're not interested in, in truth are we referring to statistical concepts um, like normality, which I think in some ways just serves to supplant truth in science. Um, well, I, and I think when we're talking about population dynamics, these things can't be modeled with statistics, they're modeled with, with differential equations right. and sort of like dynamical systems models, um, <clears throat> which sort of really explicitly don't deal with, with truth. Um, and I, 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 I think are kind of maybe more useful for talking about kind of emergent um, hierarchical systems. What I mean by truth not being relevant, of course, if you have a model, say, that captures a certain feature of the world, and, and um, you know, with, with a with a with a relevant p value and everything, like you have this finding, right? Well, once you have this finding, you can produce the sentence, you know, oh, this finding is true. But I, I just, I mean, you can do that. I just don't think it adds anything to the account, to, to the the actual scientific process, you know. Right. So. But, but what about adopting that strategically naturalist stance that I mentioned earlier when I said, well, is the question of representation an epistemological right. or an ontological one? And I have both I have heard both of you refer to certain states of affairs and things as objectively true. Like you know, Eric, you said it is objectively true that right. your aunt is your mother's sister and so right. forth. So strategically we use those concepts all the time. So so, so again I can talk about and let's be naturalists about this. Let's talk about ontology as a study of what there is, right? So I'm going to say yes. Maxwell is standing here in front of me right now. We are in a classroom, etc. And then we can distinguish between different ontological levels of where well, like meaning is not as stable, etc. Right? But the simple question that I want to ask, and I would really love to hear an answer from both of you, is that are there representations? Well, yes. Yeah. Okay. No, no. So I mean, that's not like, that's not like no, a, I mean, so we wouldn't be talking about them, is what I feel like. So if there were. That's good because I, I wonder not, what, what, what. I don't mean, know that that answers no, that much. That's, that's, no, the that, problem. that's good. That's good. <laughs> that, that helps. Okay. I don't know so, that it does. Amanda, you have a question. Yeah, no, just it means, like, I remember Eric talking when he was me, uh, reading a symbol that uh, stand for themselves, mm -hmm. Roy Wagner. Yes. And I miss something about that because I think there's something to do. I, th I think Eric can, can speak to that. You mean, yeah. what, uh, how does it relate to Roy Wagner? Like graphic meaning, all that stuff. Like, I don't know, like, I, <laughs> I miss, I just miss something about that, like, the representation, like, his point of view about representation. Yeah, it well, he has, the, so, he, so let's, it's easier if I refer to his argument in, uh, I think, in, in the invention of culture, which he's going to say, he, he's the basis Roy Wagner is an anthropologist uh, from the, he was, he was writing, I mean, he's still alive. Uh, I, I met him not too long ago. He's, he's great, he's still crazy. And he, uh, and he was writing, he wrote this book in the 70s, The Invention of Culture, which is a really important sort of predecessor both for this and the work of Marilyn Strathern, who's a, a, a really important anthropologist in the UK. And uh, he talks about how, so, he talks about it as being a case of what are the givens and whether we consider the givens to be sort of natural or whether we consider the givens to be cultural. And so he's, he makes the point that for us, na nature is the given, right? The, the natural order, all those things on the left-hand side are the givens. What needs to be explained then uh, are, the, uh, are the things on the, on the right-hand column that I put in there. Um, and so that's what's invented, right, as he says. And then he's, and, and then, he says, though, for some societies, somewhere, you know, and this is a very structuralist kind of thing, you invert everything and you say that, well, they're different from the West and that 
give some view onto us. He says um, that for them, the culture, culture is what's the given, and this is what perspectivism is sort of laying down. And what needs to be invented is actually nature. What needs to be invented are bodily capacities. What needs to be invented are things that we normally think of as belonging to the natural order. So I don't know if that gets as much into the, the stuff in that and the other one. But... Oh yeah, but it, that's yeah no that's that's just outside the scope. <laughs> what we're doing. I think Frank had a question. Yeah, yeah it, it's about truth, and it's about this idea that. So let's suppose you go to the Amazon or wherever you go, and you find these people with this radically different worldview. And somehow you're always able to translate them. Yes. And uh, that is, I think, Davidson's basic argument is that actually you can always translate what, I mean, however different people's views about something, like you can always translate it. Now, why is that? It's because basically you can agree with them. I mean, you, principle of charity, the idea is that Basically, they're, most of the time, they're right. So you have a basis, actually, to, to agree with people you share probably very little. But I mean, you can agree on some things which you share a common representation of what is the truth in the situation. That's how I imagine it. So how does that, I mean, how is that compatible with the idea that, that worlds are completely different? And on the other hand, would this actually show that truth is important? Or wouldn't this actually show that we agree on representations that are very different, but in the end not so different because we agree on the truth? Well, I mean, there's a distinction, I think, between um, being able to refer to the same thing and what the, the meaning of what we're, what we're saying actually be the case, right? So. I mean that's that's kind of like how I would approach the question is that sure we can we can agree on terms and we can agree on you know the reference of these terms and so forth, but that doesn't guarantee that you know the what what we're describing corresponds to the way we're describing it that the matter of fact corresponds to the way we're cutting it up you know I mean maybe it's. I yeah, and I, I think also, and I would say, it's like as long as truth is subordinated to agreement, then it's fine. You know, the, the problem would be to sort of do the opposite, to say that agreement has to sort of to track truth in some sort of way that's independent of either context. So, and, and so what you're saying is true, of course, we can have different worlds and they can still be translatable in that way, but translation is not a... It's not just not agreement, a, it's an agreement on the facts of the world. What's an agreement on the fact of the world? Well, I mean, you engage together with the people you're studying in the environment, in the world you're living, and you come to share a certain, a certain number of meanings. Yeah. Okay, so if, if I may step in. So the question of truth, it's a good, oblique, perhaps, or perhaps not a bit too tangential question about representation. But I just want to. Let's hold on to our thoughts for a bit. I know uh, Darcy, who's now giving us uh, an audiovisual representation of herself all the way from Cambodia, had a question, and, and I did want to make sure she got yeah, to ask it. Yeah, so, sorry, I have to, I'm muted every time, so, because it sure. looks more like a walkie-talkie here. But um, I wonder if you could speak to whether or not, I, I mean, I guess, like, for me, I'm thinking as a sensory ethnographer, about how things are actually certain things are not translatable. There are some there are some forms of representation that are not translatable, but then there are others that are. So so it's kind of like or is there it, depending on your point of view? I'm not sure. From your presentations, I didn't get. I sort of only saw like there's either one or the other. There's like there's incommensurability, and then there's non. Then there's like translation. But it seems to me that the way representation works varies, like there's different types of representation. I mm -hmm. mean, I'm, I mean, it's also just taken from the deacon and the Nordic home that I, I'm used to, so that's probably right. why. I'm sure there are other people who can speak better to it, but I just, I just wanted you guys to talk about that a little bit more. Because I would say that they're not, not everything is translatable. <laughs> but maybe that's something in the field that yeah. you 
<laughs> I, would, I would say that it's not a, I, I mean, I guess my response would just to be that I wouldn't treat translation as an either or proposition. Mm -hmm. Not as like either it's translatable or it's not translatable. It's really about, uh, especially if we're talking about how we can come to agreement about something. It's about it being good enough for use in that, right. in that, in that sort of agreement between uh, you know, the translator and the person being translated. It's, a, it's about finding like a, 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 a ground that, that works well enough. And then if it works well enough, then that's how good the translation is. I mean, I don't know that the translation, um, there's nothing essential, I guess, necessarily about the, the, the source that needs to find its way into the, into the, into the, um, into the target translation. Uh, independent of the sort of the context of trying to come up with something that works for a certain purpose, right? right. So um, that would be my. Thank you, Yeah, go ahead. I, I think that's a great question that can be translated into also a more general language for for people who are not anthropologists, because the big questions for anthropologists is about the commensurability of different cultures. So can I understand someone who lives in a world that is radically different from my own, etc. And I guess what, perhaps I'm, I'm not paraphrasing you very well, Frank, but what Frank was saying is that, is that fundamentally all humans can understand one another because of our ability to represent, because of what philosophers of mind and cognitive scientists called intentionality. You know? So to make a long story short, the property of, of our minds to be about, to represent, etc. Now, for me, a general question about translatability that I think is really interesting and that speaks to the weird status of representation is, are, do all thoughts have bodily translations? In other words, do all thoughts have grounding in phenomenal consciousness? And some people would say it's phenomenal consciousness first, then it sort of post hoc translates into thought, or the other way around. So again, if I asked you to, I don't know, remember a time you embarrassed yourself terribly, you could probably experience a nearly mirrored sort of embodied sensation of what it felt like, etc. But we could go through clients, through s series of different kinds of thoughts. I don't know if you've never heard the music of Hildegard von Bingen. It'll evoke nothing whatsoever to you. And I can imagine and project myself into all kinds of hypothetical what if, etc. could be the case situations that may not at all have phenomenal transitions. So this is also a question that I wanted to put to both of you in, in, in the audience. I mean, is it possible to have almost sort of pure representation without phenomenal consciousness, without embodiment? Do all, are all thoughts embodied? Right? Uh, well, as far as cognitive science is concerned, the, the overwhelming majority of representations are unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, almost all, actually, I would venture. Like, Be because at the same time, like when, Sometimes you try to explain the hard problem of consciousness and what phenomenolo phenomenology is. People use the example of the color red. Why does the color red feel like something? Well, sometimes I sort of beg to differ. The color red feels like nothing to me. You, know, you, you talk to me about the color, I don't know. It's just, just, it's just a pure representation. Right. right. Mm -hmm. What do you mean? Don't you feel the memory of the color? Well, uh, it's tempting to ground it in like personalized, episodic, sort of whatever, but, but also maybe not. From Cambodia, yeah. Darcy, about, yes. Uh, about the specifics, what is not translatable in her experience? Mm -hmm. did, you, did, you did, you, did you get that, Darcy? No, we're no, not hearing you. you. We're, we're not hearing you. You need to. Yeah, yeah, no, I have to mute it. Otherwise, it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, there are certain things that are untranslatable. Um, I translate them for us. <laughs> <laughs> Just say it in Cambodian, we're fine, we're good. <laughs> 
just a subject, you know, projecting a feeling onto an object. It's actually uh, the object is emitting metta, and then and then you have like this like kind of group feeling that causes the other the subject, right? The the, the person who has metta actually doesn't have metta. It's the, it's the object that has metta, but the way they they say it is. And so it's so really. <laughs> You can say like, oh, you know, you have metta because like you make me feel happy and like love and compassion, and but it's also because you have love and compassion in yourself. But it's it's so it's this is also just a bad translation. Like I can't actually describe it properly, which is why I try to use film because film um, helps to use other forms of representation that will allow for you to. Um, Kind of understand it better, but it's not. It's but it's more about understanding. It's not about translation. So is that? Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. That sounds like yeah. I don't know if I. It's also very early in the morning. No, it's. <laughs> it, I, I have uh, just a short thing to say about that. I think this is also getting back to why I think it's, it's, it's important not to think of translation as a matching game or as a one-to-one -one mapping or as a or as a mapping of concept in a source language into a concept, uh, because you're always going to have. Translations are always slightly off in that sense, right? Even though we can say amor means love, there are differences in the way that the word amor is used and the way that love is used that might become important in certain contexts where it would now be inappropriate to just switch them, to just to, to say that, okay, then amor is al always interchangeable with love. Well, it seems to me that like, the, the questions about translation that we're posing are kind of occurring at two different levels. So there's, there's the question of translating an experience into right. like a frame that's compatible with someone else's experience, and there's also linguistic translation. So I mean, there's the, there's a whole just issue about whether you know uh, translation between languages is is possible like in a, in a kind of exhaustive way, and I, I I don't think this is the case. I mean, languages are are distinct systems of symbols, and every language has their own connotations and so forth. So it's impossible to just to, to reproduce one sentence in another language that would have exactly all those connotations and cultural and so forth. But then there's the further question of translating experience, in, in, so experience being colored by representations that aren't even, even necessarily explicit and linguistic, which adds another layer of complexity to the issue. And I think on both counts, uh, I mean, translation is, is possible to a certain extent. Uh, I mean, you, you pointed this out, it, it's out pragmatically, right? I mean, right. you know, if, if you can translate something, it kind of means that, you know, pragmatically you can understand the other person. So, but, you know, I, I don't think um, it makes sense to say that there, there can be something like a perfect translation. So, 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 so now, this is where the embodied account of representation uh, perhaps can, can rescue us out of that solipsism because to go back, I think Darcy gave us a, a beautiful, actually, verbal representation of something that all of us can relate to and that all of us can feel. So, so sure, it was a sort of a more spread out account of fundamentally intersubjective mechanisms through which we are sentient beings, through which we're co-constituted as humans and as sentient beings. And, and, and I, I failed to see how we can, it's not even a question of under, understanding it, we, we could feel this. I mean, meta seems to me a really good way of, you know, of describing what phenomenologists call intersubjectivity or empathy, feeling for, about, and, and, and through others and, and ourselves. Right? I think that, that, that appeals to experience rather than to the body. You know, um, the body means different things for different cultures, right? I mean, in the cultural psychiatry class, we've been discussing this a lot, right? It, cultural idioms of, uh, of expression for symptoms. So in some cultures, um, I don't know, having a, a headache or, you know, th th there are bodily symptoms that accompany, say, depression or anxiety that, that'll be psychologized in Western cultures and so forth. So the body doesn't mean the same thing you know, like, uh, the, the, I, I think we need to be wary of uh, collapsing the body onto the biological. You know, the body is not just this sure, biological sure, fact. Sure. So, yeah, sorry? I mean, like, there was this study a few years ago where they, they had silhouettes of a human figure and they induced certain emotions in people and then they asked them to draw where on the human figure they felt the emotions okay. across cultures and they found that there was a lot of overlap. Yeah. So, I mean, like... Oh, Ekman? 
Uh, I don't remember yeah, who yeah, it yeah. was. It might have been. Fielding and Ekman and all these people. But it was like one study like two years ago. But overlap isn't the issue, you know, like just linguistic um, translations will allow for overlap. I think that the question is whether the, there can be like a, you can transpose someone's experience or someone's. Like completely. Yeah. But we, we may get, get caught up in the specifics a little too much. Allow me to share another example, which I mean, f for me, uh, enabled me to be a lot less worried about representations. And, and this is an exercise that I've shared with some of you who took the meanings in, in literacy class, which is trying to translate uh, very old uh, sort of crypto Taoist poems from uh, from the Tang from Tang Dynasty China from the from the nature poets and particularly a, a very famous poem by by Wang Wei called Deer Park which is often said to be uh, about enlightenment and in, in, in my own perspective trying to translate a language that I knew nothing about that that uh, that I could not even decipher at, at some point by using representations of representations of representation I felt that I was able to connect to some sort of fundamental experience of what it's like to be human and to be alive through all these, these levels of representations. I, I, I don't know if any of you who, who have engaged with that exercise you know, felt anything of the sort or, or not trying to put anyone on the spot, but this is, this is my sort of weak way of trying to defend that, that representations do exist, that they're a fundamental mechanism of, of what makes us the kinds of sentient beings that we are, and that they are also embodied, and that they're not necessarily a problem. Okay. But it, yeah. um, um, uh, I guess I'm getting a little mixed up on mm -hmm. what representation, representation is, but uh, um, I was wondering what is without representation, with representation, for me, like even objects and matter and um, tables and whatever are representations, right? Because like mm -hmm. you actually have to process it, and you don't see it as it, as it is. You see it through, through your um, through a whole lot of mechanisms that make make it for you what it is. So like, in what extent? Oh yeah, that's my question. Like, in what extent everything is a representation? So one thing I was going to say, I think in some ways thinking about seeing something as it is, is a bit of a red herring, right? It's, it's, it's to posit that there is something there which is, which is sort of abstracted from all of the relations it could possibly have to, to our perceptions about it. So my, my personal view is just that things in themselves are not useful, uh, like thinking about it in terms of the world itself versus how it's represented is, is maybe not, not incredibly useful, even for sort of talking about what's real or what's not. Um, but also I think that it is interesting, this kind of gets back to also something Sam was saying, that, that uh, when we talk about representations, and I think Max was, uh, was underlining this, we really need to be aware that we're talking about it in relation to intelligent or purposive behavior. Uh, because anything can co-vary with anything else with a co statistical sort of uh, patterns can can co-vary in a statistically significant way and we won't say necessarily that for instance uh, a river represents its river the riverbed just because they have to kind of conform to one another in some sort of way so I, I, I think the, the that's a good guard against saying that representations are everywhere because it's it's they, they have to be important for sort of explaining intelligent behavior. And, but then you're right, there's another whole question of like, okay, well, what's that, right? And that's a definite. Uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, something that we haven't been discussing is something that Sam pointed out in the introduction, which is uh, the distinction between something like conventional linguistic representations that are shared in a social world, and these kind of cognitive representations which arguably are not. Right? Like they're, they're very idiosyncratic, especially if you adopt like a connectionist perspective. Arguably, no two people might share the, the same representations and so forth. So there, there may be some confusion in the discussion we're having by not sufficiently distinguishing these two meanings of the word representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a philosopher, Hugh Price, who makes a good uh, distinction. He calls them I representations, which is sort of how representations work at the level of uh, of uh, inference and how they have to then represent, it's sort of how language works, you know, how it has to actually sort of represent other yeah. linguistic elements versus what he calls e-representations, which is a, the sort of environment tracking mm. function of, of, of representation. 
which obviously in the case of unconscious ones, we would be more liable to sort of talk in terms of those, re those, those functions of representation, right? right? Yeah, Josh. I thought it was interesting that the concept of truth came up so quickly, even though you guys didn't really mention it in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's interesting because obviously with representations, one of the immediate questions that comes to mind, especially if you think about things, try to think about them relationally, is what is the difference between repetition and uh, or representation and presentation, or between representations right. and just repetition. And it seems that to posit that there is like a, a, an important difference, a difference that actually makes a difference between presentation and representation, you have to posit some sort of void between the thing in itself and how it's existing in the mind of something or in an intersubjective place. I'm, because I'm, Sorry. Well, I mean, because you could do the thing where you could say that everything is just present, and that things react in a very mechanical way to their stimuli. But in that case, especially when you're looking at culture and history, every sort of like change in culture or change in history has to be explained by some change in stimulus, mm -hmm. which is a very sort of like mechanical, I guess, sort of very, very hardcore materialistic Marxian view of how history changes. But not even like really Marx went so far as to say that like every change in human sort of representational or cultural practice or belief could be explained actually by like s the stimulus, like the sort of way that the sun was encountering our eye or something like this. So there always, it seems like the question of representation is fundamentally bound up with the ontological question of what is the difference between presentation and representation? But then that immediately becomes an epistemological question or how uh, do we manage the uncertainty that exists between uh, presentation and representation, which produce interpretation, or produces interpretation. Um, because without that difference, without that difference of sort of that epistemological gap between presentation and representation, there would be no reason for us to even talk about something like representation. Because you just have mechanical systems that were uh, reacting in a very predictable manner to uh, stimuli, right? Like, and that's like the whole, like the school and the whole like distinction between a, a muscle or an organic system and a mechanical system is that a mechanical system only responds to specific stimuli in a very predictable manner. An organic system responds to a certain like uh, spectrum of stimuli in an inferential manner, uh, depending on the strength of the stimuli. Um, but. but you have you have inferential mechanisms. Right. So, like, if, if the predictive coding story at the very end there that I was uh, talking about is is at all probative, then uh, what brains are, are essentially inference machines, yeah. right? So, I, I kind of I, I kind of think that breaks down the dichotomy. But what what do you mean specifically by a presentation? Because there are kind of two uh, different ways of talking about it. I guess one is the more uh, cognitive scientific way, I mean Rick Grush has talked about it this way, so in some sense, you know, like the impinging sensory stimulus that's that's transduced, you know, it, well, that's a presentation, you know, it, it's slightly different from the kind of representational state that's going to be manipulating the information afterwards, so there's that, you, you could be meaning that, I don't know if that's what you mean, but you could also mean like in the more phenomenological sense. So like uh, the phenomenological literature loves to distinguish between you know, presentations and representations in the sense that when I'm experiencing all of you in the room, it's a presentation to my consciousness, you know, like a, the, there, there's a state of affairs and I'm, I'm conscious of it and I can think about it afterwards, but that's a re-presentation. So I'm just not sure what, what, what specifically do you mean by a presentation? Well, I mean it in the precisely scalar sense with, with that you were just talking about with okay. both those examples in the sense that it depends on the system you're talking about. Yeah. So what, the, what I'm really interested in is what is the difference between the two? Right. Because if, I mean, because in the first case, I mean, there's a difference between mechanical or like some sort of stimulus and then the reaction, right. uh, the informational content or the, uh, the reaction of a biological system. But in the second case, similarly, there's still uh, categories of sort of like, let's say, unfolding. Right. And then there's like whatever we do with those categories or, you know, in a phenomenological sense, whether we can translate them to others or produce art or... Right. Well, I, I think in the first case, it's not very problematic, right? Because it just turns on the distinction between, you know, an input and further processing. 
So you know, I mean, uh, in in the original slides, I had coded color coded input as as in red, I think, just to, to mark the distinction because it, there is an important distinction. I mean, really, uh, it, it's kind of weird when you think about it. The the nervous system kind of acts like a synthesizer or a sampler, right? right. So you know. Uh, our transducing surfaces, our, the cells in the retina and everything are, are working with continuous physical signals and then they're, they're translating it into not quite digital but at least uh, more discrete ner nervous impulses and so forth that are treated. So uh, in that sense I don't think the, the distinction is too problematic but it, there really is a problem in the philosophy of mind at least, you know, this, this distinction between presentations and representations. I mean, I just want to stress that the, the account I was giving is an account uh, in the epistemology of cognitive science, right? So, I mean, there's, a, there's an entire debate uh, over whether, you know, our conscious everyday experience is representational or not. You know, is, is there such a thing as just a pure non-representational, non-conceptual state? And that's an, another, another set of questions, I think, uh, but they're very interesting questions. And, wasn't that in some sense that I was watching this Andy Clark presentation and he was sort of saying that <clears throat> on the predictive coding story, then the, really the point is that we don't perceive sense data. Yeah. What we perceive is something that's already structured exactly. in, in, some, in some sort of way. So the question of going from presentation to representation, I think, is uh, it's difficult to know where, where presentation would, or where the distinction, I guess, would, would, would necessarily lie. It'd be very hard to pull them apart. Um, yeah. Frank. Yeah. I, have a, I would like to go back to this idea about the intelligent behavior. And you give this nice example of doing like complicated calculus on the blackboard. And when you, I mean, you wouldn't be able actually to continue at some point because you need the kind of surrounding to even continue the, right. the thinking. But I mean, could one generalize? From there to action in general, in general, oh, yeah. I mean any type of action, and and then I'm, I'm just wondering, would one explain action in terms of representations because that is what defines the uh, identifies the action as being this kind of action rather than a different kind of action, or if on the other hand, I mean it's just the opposite actually from the move you made. You said it is you would need action to explain representation, or like as an, as an, like to extend it outside of the mind. So it would like, so the, the, the physical surrounding or the action of the bodily or whatever comes in in addition to the representation. But if you think in terms of how would you explain action in the first place, I mean, I'm going out there to smoke a cigarette. I mean, basically you have to have a kind of a description of the thing I'm doing in order to even be able to talk about it. So actions can only be identified in terms of representations. And on the other hand, you need action actually to go beyond representations, it seems like not. Yeah, uh, and it, I, I don't think the two are neatly separable. In fact, uh, one of the great, uh, I think, contributions of the whole predictive coding framework, I, re I, I would have loved to have more time to really go on about this, because this is like this is where it's at right now, is the predictive coding stuff, as far as I can tell. Uh, but in these frameworks, action and, uh, and perception and memory are all unified in this one kind of framework. So it's, um, okay, just very schematically in these, in, these, uh, in these frameworks, the point is to minimize prediction error constantly, right? So you, you have a prediction and then you have a sensory signal, you compare the two and you're trying to minimize the difference constantly, right? So in these frameworks, action is action is a kind of prediction, right? So when, when I want to move, for instance, uh, the, the nervous system generates a prediction of movement and when nothing kind of happens, bodily mechanisms are recruited to, to minimize the difference, kind of like if you revised your your, uh, your your models, right? That would be behavior rather than yeah. action, actually. Well, what would be the difference between behavior and action? Well, basically, uh, if, you, if you describe what an ant is doing, the ant doesn't have to be conscious about what and kind of directing its behavior consciously to be the kind of thing it is. It just is. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I think the difference is consciousness. Mm 
and the fact that yeah. consciousness yeah, that, that influences yeah, the, sure. the, yeah. the yeah. Yeah. sure. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask one, one last question because I think or I think it's a really interesting one that always bothers me. In 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 anything uh, in the talking about an extended mind, what exactly is getting extended? Because when I think about it, any kind of thought will involve some sort of uh, physical intermediary in order to sort of manifest, right? So anything is extended into whether it's the graphemes that we have to use in order to represent language to ourselves or whether it's sort of the neural synapses themselves are going to have to be involved in some way. So I'm, I'm always very curious about this idea that there's a strong difference between stuff that's happening in the head versus stuff that's happening uh, out in the world or, or well, beyond the body. There's a, there's a debate in the literature right now. Um, I mean, you, know, you describe me as a kind of reformed and activist, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm more skeptical about these positions is I realize that um, they're very heterogeneous, right? I mean, you know, 4EA cognition is more uh, a slogan mm -hmm. than it is an actual coherent theoretical edifice, you know. So there's this debate right now between uh, embedded mind theorists or uh, scaffolded cognition theorists um, like uh, Bryce Huebner and uh, John Sutton and Adams and Ayazawa who are basically arguing that actually the mind doesn't really extend out into the environment. It's more that there's a kind of scaffolding Right? So we have these cognitive technologies and what they allow us to do is augment our cognitive capacities, but we're not in any literal sense extending the mind out there. And this is kind of like a reactionary, I mean, in, in the best possible sense, right? It's a kind of reactionary view against um, more extreme positions, which I, I, I mean, I, there's something to it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm still very divided on these issues, but people like Andy Clark and uh, David Chalmers in their 98 paper, um, the extended mind uh, will, will argue that actually, well, the mind is literally what extends out into the environment. You know, it's not just uh, it's not just a question of recruiting certain kinds of technologies and stuff to augment our capacities, but it's literally the cognition itself is actually extending into these things. So, you know, uh, just a, uh, an example to kind of grasp what's what's at stake is I'm using Google Search for whatever you know, I'm at representation in Google Search. Well. When I do that, are the Google algorithms part of my mind? You know, like, is, is the whole Google server edifice and everything that's running the algorithms, are these things literally part of my mind? In some sense, you want to say, yeah, because they're performing cognitive functions that I would have performed, you know, if I hadn't had Google, I would have had to go, go through, like, all these site directories and look for, so in a sense, yeah, but in another sense, no, you know, the, some, the, there's an asymmetry between what's going on in the brain and what's what's going on in the world, and I'm, I'm coupling myself in an adequate way to augment my capacities for intelligent, flexible behavior, but I'm not necessarily um, extending my mind. So, I mean, this is still very contentious. If you're interested, I could send you, there's, there's kind of significant literature growing around this right now. So, so allow me to, and I think we'll need to conclude soon, but. I had one question for Eric. Okay. I just, I just want to ask, pose a question and then see if, if we can work with that. And, and, right. Because I want to translate all these questions into a different kind of language to think about and with the extended mind metaphor in ways that are easier to understand and impossible to accept at the same time. And I want to return to very unfashionable claims about basically representations existed out there, right? So the sort of the super organic view of culture, that's the Durkheimian view of culture that is extremely unfashionable now, that is dismissed as cheaply metaphysical. But I want to still, because I'm not sure that everybody's had a chance, to, uh, sorry, have a look at, at the readings, but ask the question posed by Dan Sperber, why do we have epidemiology of representations? Why do we, it appears as though there are these public representations out there that to venture a really bad metaphor infect people's minds. How do we have racism and sexism without representations, right? right. How do we have meta, uh, this, this, this sort of complex uh, em empathy concept floating somewhere over Southeast Asia where people will embody culturally appropriate ways of, of feeling this meta thing without even being able to explain it, right? Why do we have categories of made up people that are, don't really exist biologically, that come prepackaged in ideas with bundles of attributes, like black people are good at sports and Asians are good at math or whatever. I'm giving you very simple examples. 
what do they come to be embodied, right? So, I think so, so there, there you extend right, the, the representations. I'm not saying this is what I believe, but it's a problem that it has become unfashionable to pose these questions and to ask, to say, well, this is really the problem of representation. Right? Right. Well, I mean, my question for Eric has to do with this. So I'm very sensitive to uh, the argument in, in the assigned readings that, you know, there's, there's almost something imperialist and colonialist about the idea that, you know, if we want to understand a given culture, we have to understand their beliefs, you know, mm -hmm. and their cognitive representations, because the, it, that's what it would redound to, right? Is that they're, they're operating with different beliefs, and you know, we 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 have knowledge and so forth, and you know, mm -hmm. we have, if we if we want to understand their practices, then we have to understand, you know, what they're thinking and everything. So there's, I mean, I, I understand why you would want to move into an ontological direction and actually say, well, you know, it's not it's not just a question of beliefs. It's a question of living in another world. It's a question of meaning, you know, just emerging differently from a different kind of situation. But in line with what Sam just said, I always get the feeling that by kind of rejecting um, the interpretive framework on the one hand and the cognitive framework on the other in anthropology, we're, we're kind of underplaying the deep kind of coupling there is between um, a world as it gives itself you know, in, in the experience of a person, and representations in the cognitive sense, uh, it, it, as these causal intermediaries that allow us to grasp the world as being this or that. So you kind of ended on a conciliatory note. I just right. wanted to just pick your mind about that. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, I, I want to start also with this idea then saying, when we use the phrase out there, I find that a really strange phrase. I don't really know what we mean by out there. Do we mean out there beyond human Interaction? Do we mean out there beyond sort of social mean, like socially determined, or so, or, or meaning that emerges through social interaction? I mean, so, so take for example we, the idea out there yeah. of uh, that that there are certain kinds of humans that are classed into races and are some are better than others. An idea that not that very many of us are committed to preserving and to actively <laughs> teaching. Now we know that that mostly by age four. Children who are, even before going to school, even when their parents do not explicitly teach them those ideas, their, their, their peers do not, their teachers do not, the media does not explicitly teach it yet, it's out there, there's this dominant hegemonic idea. The and they, and they pick it and they pick it up from somewhere, right? So, so here's well, an then example they, they do it implicitly. Of, of, of an, sure, implicitly. <laughs> but then, so, so it's in here in the sort of hidden unconscious, so we're sort of, we're sort of passing on these unconscious ideas without. I mean, I, I don't have the answer to these questions. I think they're hard ones that, that people don't really ask anymore. I mean, that's an interesting Be, because because it because it's somehow unsophisticated to speak of representation mm -hmm. on some level. But but I agree. I mean, out, out there it, it's ontologically problematic. But if I if I put it in those terms, it's shocking. And now now we have to try to face the problem. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I would guess say that the out there is just another in here. You know, sure. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's sort of a question of framing. It's embodied. Yeah. So, so, so that like bacteria that we're not aware that that we're we're carrying that we're just sort of passing on when we shake hands or. But I mean, you could say that like a, I mean, children are famous for like seeing the truth of the situation between parents or adults or something like this, and it's sort of pointing out the elephant in the room. And mm -hmm. I mean, if, if media, if like pop cultural studies has any merit, I guess it would be that, like, I mean, it would have to be correct that it's pointing out that there's lots of tropes that just circulate in media and so forth. And mm -hmm. children see those tropes by watching television or listening to the radio. Perhaps there are inferences about those tropes that produce racist inferences or racist ideas are just, you know, these unfiltered, unsophisticated inferences that haven't been sort of uh, censored yet by like a a politically correct upbringing or education. But in that case, it goes back to, once again, that like representations are just the product of developing inferences. But once again, sure. it comes back to the sort of like, yeah, once again, this gap between uh, Sure. You're it, an but it's about out. it's about inferring and abstracting a broader representational structure. I mean, it's sort of like the poverty of stimulus argument in Chomsky and linguistics, which is also not fashionable anymore. And I'm not a Chomsky monitor. I don't believe that there is a language gene. Right. However, I mean, we know that children are never explicitly taught how to grammatically handle a language, and 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 yet they pick up on the broader structure. And and, and humans are very good at doing that. 
We, we pick up on, on rule governed systems without being aware that they're there, that there are rules that we're playing them, and we do that all the time, right? So again, it's as though there's this representational system out there that, that we pick up or that, that sort of you know, controls us. I, I, I know. Yeah, it's a, as though it's like that. It's, it's as though <laughs> it's, it's, it's important. Like that. But that's yeah. perhaps our best explanation. It's as though it is like that. Well, in the predictive coding literature, uh, there are two different kinds of inference, right? So there's a more passive inference, which is basically fitting representation to the world. Mm -hmm. What am I seeing here? You know, and just, okay, testing this hypothesis. Is this, is this what I'm seeing? No, I kind of, uh, is it an orange? I'm not quite sure. So that's one form of inference, but there's also active inference, right? Mm -hmm. So there's another way to test a hypothesis, which is to change the world, right? And I get the feeling that a lot of these implicit kind of racist attitudes and everything have to do with active inferences that you know you're you're gonna you imagine that this kind of category of person is that kind of way and then you react to them in that way and you get these kind of self-reinforcing loops where you know you you act with disdain towards someone and mm -hmm. they they can kind of feel that you know these you know. yeah but i mean in the four-year-old's case that wouldn't be i mean and, and there's two different kinds of inference like in general it seems i mean once again we'd have to explain like uh is that a cognitive mechanism or something like that? Like, I mean, it's probably practically speaking just some sort of spectrum of you yeah. know, making inferences and then immediately acting on them or just making inferences and being kind of passive about them. Yeah, of course. And then, you know, well, all the options yeah. in between. We but, have yeah. pretty good experimental evidence for essentialism being being a cognitive mechanism that's certainly culturally mediated, but mm -hmm. but prepackaging mental categories full of you know culturally mediated attributes or whatever. I mean, otherwise, if we had to make conscious sense of every situation all the time, I mean, we, we would not be able to function. Yeah. So it's embodied. And that's sure. <laughs> sure, it's embodied. Yeah. That's a sort of like cognitive science that I think could say that. Well, Dogs embody it then too, there are plenty of racist dogs. There are plenty of racist dogs. Dogs are really, really good at picking up on human semiosis. I mean, dogs yeah. can understand pointing, right? So, so dogs, to make a simple cognitive story, I mean, they can, they can sort of perspective take, they can understand other people's men, human mental states in ways that even chimps or so we're told cannot. Also, that if I'm not... Process, so yeah, it is, it is, and it's representational. Yeah. So I think it's fundamentally anthropocentric, horribly racist to say that only humans represent the world in their minds to interact with it. I think all sentient beings do. That that's, that might take all of it. But can it yeah. can it be explained also like the racism thing by just difference? Because like um, we saw that, for example, really young children just prefer to look at their mother's face than mm -hmm. anyone else's face, right? So like, um, it's also possible that all those racial considerations are based on just a simple mechanism of preparing something that is familiar than... Yeah, that, that, that's another question, but I mean, we're working on this right now with a, a team of people. But we can't presuppose that, for example, skin color and phenotype is an actual feature of the world that's ob objectively discernible out there, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, there are many ways in which we're enculturated and skilled to pay attention to certain things and not to others. But, but overall... Well, sure, just look at who's white and what country. But, it, sure, it doesn't but have much to do with melanin. But the evidence that what you call whiteness is yeah. an obvious marker of salience or difference for neonates the question is still open, basically. I mean, we have, we have studies, looking time studies, it's hard to study babies, right? Mm -hmm. So looking time studies where babies seem to notice people of different phenotype because it's weird, others who don't, or others who just... Okay. And again, we're making all these really huge inferences based on basically, you know, if a baby looks at something for two seconds, then yeah, yeah. construct this huge <laughs> theoretical edifice, and it's... Wow. Well, with attention spans these days, that's kind of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't we shut it down? Sure, sure. Any any other closing remarks, comments, questions, gut feelings? Oh, I want to thank everybody for coming. Yeah, thanks for your thanks. attention. Thanks for, thanks for thanks. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for doing the presentation. Thanks, Sam, for putting this together. That was it was all of us. It was all of us, right? Yeah. Shall we clap? <laughs> okay, and, and tomorrow we we won't be meeting. You know. Uh, every consecutive day, every week like this, but tomorrow we have a great talk on psychedelics. So please come, bring, fr bring friends, bring whatever subjects. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon?
It's in Macintosh. No, it's yeah, yeah, Macman, Macman, right? the green room. Mushroom things. Yeah, green exactly. Whatever you have. Yeah.